Johnny Dollar. Hey, Johnny, listen. This is Steve. Steve? You know, Steve Yoakum. Oh, yeah, way out there in... Uh, where is that, Steve? Kalispell, Kalispell, Montana. Oh, yeah. You know, Four State Mutual. Right. Well, what seems to be the trouble, Steve? Listen, uh, can you fly on out here right away, Johnny? Sure, I guess so. What's up? Uh, one of my clients, John Turner Whittacombe. Rich old man. Got him insured for nearly 500 grand. And? Well, if what it looks like has happened, the company's going to be out almost a million. You know, because of the double indemnity. For accidental death. Yeah. If, like I say, that is the way it's happened. I mean, if it's happened at all. Well, is he dead or isn't he? <laughs> that's the trouble. I don't know. Not for sure. What do you mean? I mean, that's what you better get on out here and find out for us. All right. And if he is dead, whether it was accidental or it wasn't, but if he isn't dead, well, that we got to know about, too. But if he is... <laughs> all right, all right, Steve. I'll be out to see you. What I mean is... Uh-huh. Oh. Okay, Johnny. Right. Listen, if you can catch a plane tonight, you ought to get here sometime in the morning. I'll be waiting for you at the airport. Well, first I'd better check a schedule of me. Hello? Hello? Okay, Rattlebrain, I'll be there. The CBS Radio Network brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Mutual Insurance Company office in Kalispell, Montana. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Yak mystery matter. Expense account item one, 10 cents for a morning paper. After carefully checking meteorological reports for a slant on the weather in northwestern Montana, I made sure to throw some gloves, heavy woolen socks, and a set of long-handled underwear into my luggage. Item two, five bucks for a cab to Bradley Field. Item three, 145.50, plane fare. It was almost 9.30 a.m. by the time we sat down at the small but prosperous-looking city of Kalispell. And true to his word, young Steve Yoakum was there at the airport. We piled ourselves and my luggage into a jeep that had the side curtains up, but no heater. And then, took off. Now, reaching back of you, Johnny. Swap that top coat of yours for a sheepskin you'll find back there. You're going to need it where we're going. Well, where's that, Steve? A hundred, thirty, forty miles up to the Yak. The what? Up near a town called Yak, if you can call it a town. Just a glorified crossroads. Maybe 40, 50 people living around there. Put it on. You'll need it. Well, you're the doctor, Steve. Yeah, we're going in real snow country. You still haven't told me why. Oh, well, that client of ours, John Turner Whittacombe, made a lot of dough in lumber. When his wife died, he retired. So? He and his good-looking daughter, Valerie, it's his only child, and her husband, Lou Larson, took off last week for a little vacation. A little hunting, maybe, out of Shorty Bessem's camp. That's up in the rugged country east of Yak, over near Lost Horse Mountain. And what's happened to him? Well, I got a call from Shorty Bessem just before I called you. Seems the weather had calmed down for a couple of days, and Whittacombe and the kids took some gear and horses and went out hunting. Hunting at this time of year? What for, Steve? Well, that's what I don't understand. But they went out anyway, over Shorty's protest. Oh? Yeah, they not only didn't come back, but Shorty hasn't been able to find hide nor hair of them. Oh, fine. Ninety miles out of Kalispell on Route 2, we stopped for lunch at the colorful sawmill town of Libby, a kind of headquarters and main supply point for the logging operations in that area. And then we cut north on one of the worst roads that I'd ever traveled. Yeah, the snow plows had been through, but that was all. And what's more, it clouded up. And then what started out as a cold drizzle turned into a heavy, wet snowfall. 
in the middle of May yet. Steve had called it rugged country, and he wasn't kidding. Most of what we passed through was heavy forest land, spots almost impenetrable. Except perhaps for the logging trails here and there, lots of big trees, jungle of heavy, tangled undergrowth. Not a good place to get lost. It mighty good hunting country, too, Johnny. I mean, when the weather's good. Lots of deer and bear and wolves, mountain lions, lots of things. At Yak, we stopped long enough to fill up with gas. That's item four, 470. And then plunged into the deep forest. Going eastward on, believe it or not, an even worse piece of road, following a vague sort of wagon path through the trees and the heavy snow. Only a four-wheel drive would ever have made it. It was after 5 p.m. by the time we finally got to Shorty Besson's camp. But there, in the big log cabin, or rather lodge, Mrs. Besson, a bright-eyed, sprightly old lady, took one look at our frost-bitten faces, sat us down in front of a roaring fire. And that stone fireplace was big enough to walk into. Logs burning in it were over a foot thick. And then she poured us full of strong, steaming coffee, heavily laced with rum. And I began to feel warm for the first time in hours. Well, I told him, Mr. Dolly. Yes, yes Shorty? Yes, sir. Shorty told Mr. Whittaker and those young kids they oughtn't to pack out in those woods without him going along with them. Yes, sir. I told him, Mr. Dolly. I told him likely there might be another snow coming up, too. But Mr. Whittaker just wouldn't listen to him. Here, now, have some more of this. Oh, no, thanks, Mrs. Besson. Oh, name's Kate, and you know you need this. You two, two still look a little blue around the gills in the cold out there. Thank you. Put some more rum in it, Shorty. Huh? Oh, sure, Kate. You too, Mr. Yoakum. Huh? Oh, don't mind if I do. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Whittacombe just wouldn't listen. Him having been such a great hunter all over the world so much, over in Africa, over in Kilimanjaro, Kendi, and all those other places he talks about, all around high mountains, all kinds of weather. Just wouldn't listen. Yeah, just wouldn't listen. Ask me. I think he was trying to prove with that son-in-law that young Larson was really a man up in this country. But at least he promised he'd be back the next morning, so, well, I, I let him take some of the horses and go. Then it snowed a bit that night. Yeah, it snowed a bit. When they didn't come back, well, that's when Shorty rounded up the Branson boys and Sid Keeler from over near the ranger station. They started looking. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They started looking. Up until dark yesterday and most of today. Out of that snow, they couldn't even find their tracks. No, couldn't find their tracks. And they hadn't said where they was going to, so all we could do is look at all the likely places, but we didn't find a sign of them. Well, then, Steve, how did you expect me to find them when these people who know this country so well can't do it? Well, I know, Johnny, but... No, wait. Listen. What is it, Shorty? Why, yes, that's a horse out there. Oh, maybe they're back. They're all right after all. Come on, boys. Right. No, look. What's that? Johnny. Good Lord. Yeah. What's the matter, Shorty? What is it? It's that son-in-law, young Larson, out there. Well, don't just stand around outside there talking about it. Get him in here. Yeah, but he's just laying there in the saddle like Come he... on, come on. Let's see if he's still okay. <laughs> Larson. Larson, you still alive? Steve, give me a hand with him. Help me get him out of that saddle. Sure, Johnny. Here. Here now. He's still alive, Mr. Dollar? I don't know, Shorty. I don't know. Well, get him inside here where I can do him some good. But easy now, Steve. Easy with him. Yeah, Johnny. Yeah, I'll take care of the horse. Lou Larson was still alive. And I wondered how a city boy, that was obvious from his soft hands and pale complexion, his general build, I wondered how he had managed to survive when the others... the others... But it was well into the night by the time Kate brought him around, enough to tell us what had happened. They're dead. They're dead, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Whittacombe and my... my Valerie. Oh, that... Poor, lovely little girl. Where, Lou, and how did it happen? Somewhere. Somewhere on the south slope of 
Lost Horse Mountain. Yeah. At least that's where that's where Mr. Whittacombe said we were. Now here, now, boy, you just get some more of this hot coffee inside of you. Yeah, boy. Get some hot coffee in you. Thanks. I, I'm feeling all right now, I, I think. Go on, Lou. What happened? When the snow came, he he said we'd better make camp. Not try to get back here. Now, that was wrong of him. He'd have known this country at all. I wondered about that, too, Kate. It was getting dark. He found a kind of shelter and built a fire. It was under some big rocks beside a real deep crevice. On the side of the Lost Horse Mountain? Yes. Oh, oh that, be, that was Dead Man's Hole. It was very narrow. Very deep. Yeah, it's a death trap. That's all it is, a death trap. It's a death trap. That's what it is. told me to go look around for some more wood while he and Val try to make camp. But, but, but a fire under the snow that piles up there? Dollar, if my horse hadn't followed me, we, we'd have died out there, too. Maybe it would have been better if I'd stayed with him with, with Valerie and died with her. Easy now. She was my wife, Mr. Dollar. I, I loved her very much. I know, Lou. Go on, please. I only got a couple of hundred feet away when I heard that terrible sound. Like thunder. An avalanche. That's what it was. And I looked back. And that's what's taken the lives of more people in that awful chasm. It's a death trap, I tell you. It's a death trap. Go on, Lou. All I could see was thousands of tons of snow and rocks falling down where I'd left them. Rolling everything, even their horses, into that chasm. It was terrible. Terrible. All right. Now, son, you just take, an, take yourself another drink of this, and then you sleep a while. Thank you, Kate. I'm so tired. So tired. Sure you are. Here, you men help him into bed. Yeah, come on, Shorty, give me a hand. Yeah, sure, you? Mr. Dollar. Uh, we, we'll put him in what was Mr. Whittacombe's room. It'll be warmer there. That's a good idea. It'll also give me a chance to... What's the matter, sir? Come on. Let's get him to bed. It's, uh, getting kind of late, Mr. Dollar. The other folks are all asleep. How far is it to that canyon, Shorty? Oh, a couple of hours, if you know the way. If you don't know the way, in this kind of weather, it could take a couple of days, like it did young Larson. Awful easy to get lost out there. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking of going out and trying to find them, Mr. Dollar, eh, there's no point in it. Why do you say that? Well, like Kate said, they're not the first to have fell in dead man's hole. But nobody's body has ever been drug out of it. Why not? It's too deep, too dangerous, too easy to start more rocks sliding down inside of it. Well, I'll take your word for it. Most anything would start a slide there. Build a fire under the snow overhang on top of that rock he was talking about, you'd start a snow avalanche. Really? Yeah. Just fire a shot on some of the smaller rocks on the side, you'd start them tumbling down. Why, even a little animal walking around up there would do it. Mm. Oh, well. oh, it's happened many times, Mr. Dollar. Read up in all the books that ever been wrote about this part of the country. Yeah. Well, now, Mr. Dollar, I don't know about you, but it's late and everybody else is to bed, so why don't you and me hit the sack, too, huh? Nothing more we can do tonight, anyhow. You go ahead. I'll be along shortly. I don't know what I was really looking for there in Lou Larson's room. And I had to be very quiet. But then, in one of his suitcases, under a pile of shirts, was a piece of a topographical map. A map of the area surrounding Lost Horse Mountain. At one point on the south side was a check mark to what was obviously a very deep, narrow canyon. And there was a book, too. The Legend of Lost Horse Mountain. All right? Reason for suspicion? Sure. But that was all. Or was it all? The next morning was, surprisingly enough, quite warm though heavy storm clouds raced across the sky. Uh, you never know this time of year, Mr. Dollar. One day it'll be hot like this. 
Next, it'll be freezing up again, or maybe snow. I knew now that I had to have a look down in a dead man's hole, and before another avalanche could fill it up some more. It happens eight, ten, fifteen times a year. Uh, they'll never fill up that big chasm. Washes out in the summer floods, anyhow. Over his protest, Shorty and I set out on a couple of the horses, armed with pick and shovel and a pair of binoculars. As for Steve Yoakum, who'd struck me as being pretty useless in a situation like this, I left him behind to look after young Larson, still asleep in Whittacombe's bed. I don't like those clouds, Mr. Dollar. Chances are we're going to get a lot of rain. Well, it's a chance we'll have to take. But if you think I'm going to let you lower yourself down in dead man's hole to look for a couple of bodies that are probably all covered up anyway... Sorry, Shorty, but I have to. Now, let's get there before this storm breaks. But we didn't. And when a storm hits that part of the country, it isn't fooling. Together, Shorty and I stood on the lower, the firm edge of that canyon, the only safe part of it, across from where the others had been. Look! Look! There they are, down there. I see them. The rain has melted away the snow that covered them up. But we'll never get to them. Let me have those field glasses. Oh, sure, here. Thanks. This rain will also cover them up again with all the rocks and stuff it'll wash down there and that'll be the end of them. Oh, no, it won't, Shorty. Break out those ropes and help me down there. Now, don't you try it, Don. Come on, come on, help me rig a line. Now, I tell you, you're crazy. Sure, I was crazy. But what I'd seen in the glasses had told me that Mr. Whittacombe and his daughter had been murdered before they'd been thrown into that canyon. Bullet holes in their heads. Slowly, I worked my way down toward them, careful not to dislodge any rocks or rain-soaked clumps of gravel. And now, even without the glasses, I could see the bullet holes. Now that you're sure, come on back here. Come on back up, Dollar. Just, just another few feet so I can get a line on them and we can... What was that? That wasn't no thunder. The dollar, that was a rifle shot. I know. From lengthwise down the canyon. It hit that rock on the other side, broke it loose. I know. Look out. Another avalanche. Dollar! Shorty Bessem ever managed to haul me up out of that pit of death with tons and tons of rock and mud pouring down all around me from the far side of the chasm, I'll never know. But somehow he did. And then, panting from exhaustion, we lay there well back from the edge, the blessed rain in our faces. Uh, I'm sure they was rifle shots, Dollar. I'm sure of it. And when I saw one of the key rocks blasted away over there and start another slide again... And I'm betting it was the same rifle that was used to kill Whittacombe and his daughter before they were thrown down in there. Young Larson. He knew how easy it was to start a slide at this spot from a book that he'd read. One of those that you talked about. And he knew that nobody but a fool like me would try to come here and look for those bodies. Well, why, Dollar? Why? Money. Oh. Whittacombe didn't like him, did he? No, sir. That's true. Kate said that Whittacombe brought him out here to see if he was really a man. Yes, sir, that's true. And that means he didn't like having young Larson married to his daughter, in line to share all of his money when he died. Valerie was his only child. That's true, too, Dollar. But why should Lou share it? By getting rid of both of them, he could have it all. That is true. Sure it is. But he seemed awful sorry about losing that Valerie. Oh, sure. He broke right down and cried. Well, that he did. Sure he did. 
But he also recovered pretty darn quickly, Shorty, in order to go on with his explanation of what was supposed to have happened out here. Oh, that's true, too. But believe me, the only reason that Larson ever married that girl was to get his hands on the old man's money. Certainly never did any work with those hands of his. So maybe Kate is right. I mean, despite the way she's taken care of him after he came in, well, she just didn't like him, didn't trust him. Wait a minute, Shorty. Huh? If he's still around here and armed with a gun, I mean, those shots. Oh, he was still asleep when we left, and that insurance man, that uh, Steve Yoakum, is watching over him. He was him. supposed to be watching him. He could have slipped away from Steve. Now, uh, maybe Larson saw the slide and thought it killed us both and went back. Maybe. But if he is still around... Right here, Dollar. Huh? Now, don't move, either of you. Uh, put, the, uh, put down that rifle now, Lou. Not a chance, Shorty. Then all I said was true, huh, Lou? Of course it was, Dollar. But nobody else will ever know it. How nice of you to come out here. We're another rock slide, and this time a big one will take care of you. Well, what you gonna do, Larson? Very stupid of you, Dollar, to go through my things last night. Wasn't it pretty stupid of you to come out here after us? Who came where? So far as anyone knows, when I left the lodge, it was simply to wander aimlessly about in the woods, in a sort of uh, delirium, following my state of near exhaustion. That pretended state of exhaustion. Fooled you, didn't I? And Shardy and his wife, even that stupid insurance man. I should have realized your horse Betsy was in too good shape when you brought her in last night. <laughs> of course, Shorty. Because Betsy and I had been perfectly comfortable in your hay shed, the other side of the property. All the time we were supposed to be missing. So, now you got to us. What you gonna do, Larson? Me? Nothing. You're gonna do it for me. Up on your feet now. Huh? I said, up on your feet. Come on. Uh, well, sure, but... Uh, Very careful, he... Dollar. I warn you. You have the gun, Lou. I'll back up. Back up. Way into that canyon? You too, Dollar. No, 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 no. It'll kill us. It's either that or a bullet, Shorty. Back up. Better look behind you, Lou. Come off it, Dollar. That old gag won't work. Now back up. Sorry, Lou. And you give me no choice. He means it, Dollar. He means it. He's going to shoot you. I doubt it. Shorty is right, Dollar. You're going now. You're going... Now, huh? Get his rifle, Shorty. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. <sighs> But that gunshot, Mr. Dollar, where'd it come from? I'm sorry, Johnny. Almost didn't make it. Mr. Yoko. You're telling me, Steve? When he sneaked out of the lodge, I thought instead of stopping him, I'd better follow, see what he was up to. And you were suspicious of him, too, huh? Well, sure, but man, with him making such time for a guy supposed to be all in, and me not used to walking so far, well, I almost didn't make it, and I'm sorry. You did all right, Steve. <laughs> you sure did, son. <laughs> So the laws of succession take over and somebody else gets the insurance and the old man's estate. And as for Lou Larson, well, even hanging's too good for that kind. Expense account total, including the trip home, two oh seven seventy five. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star with an important message and a few words about next week's story. The CBS radio network and this station are both very much a part of National Radio Month. But the figures show that you, the listener, are just as much a part of the celebration. You take part every month of every year with your purchases of new radio sets. Today, there's an all-time record number of radio sets in use. Today, there are more listeners than ever. And the number one network for the best sound around is, of course, CBS Radio. And now, next week, the stock in trade matter. And the stock I'm talking about is just exactly that. Stock. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Reddick, is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zarato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Robert Dryden as Shorty, Bill Lipton as Steve, Athena Lord as Kate, and Ellen Manson as Lou Larson. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Art Hanna speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.